Welcome. My name is Mark DePew. I'm here for my second session today with Jerry Roschke. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Mark. It is the 30th of July, 2018. Today, we get to talk about your experiences in combat, and we spent the last session last Friday talking in detail, and as you know, I always like to get the background, you certainly have an interesting background, and to hear all of the the path somebody like you, a gunner on a B-26, has to take before you actually get to combat. But last time we left you, just got into Sardinia. So I want to kind of backtrack a little bit. You went first to Casablanca, then to Algiers, Algiers. then to Naples? Yes, <clears throat> Naples, right. Okay. Did, I mention about, did I mention Vesuvius there? No, you didn't. Okay, that, that's... Um, we went to Naples before uh, flying to Sardinia. Vesuvius had just exploded. In fact, one of our aircraft, not before my time, the, the day or so before, was caught in the thing. And in, in Naples, the dust, the volcanic dust, was so thick, it was about four to six inches deep. And when you hit flour, you know how it splatters? Well, that's exactly what was happening uh, when walking around in Naples. And it was six inches deep all the way. In fact, I got so much of the volcanic dust in my hair that I had to have my head shaved because it was just it was just, just really bad. And boy, if you didn't, I looked a sight. I looked a <laughs> sight. Okay. Well, maybe Mildred, well, it's good that Mildred wasn't seeing you when you look like that. Well, actually, there's one good point there. They took pictures at that in Naples for prisoner of war pictures. You know, you'd have one. So if you're a prisoner of war, you could get it out. Boy, did I look mafia. <laughs> I really, really looked like a mafia. When you were in Naples, I'm not sure how much Naples was pummeled by the fighting, but obviously the, the Americans were north of there by that time. But did you see a lot of battle scarring? Not a lot. Not a lot because we were pretty well kept in our little confines, a little area. So okay. we didn't get into, we didn't get into Naples at all, I don't recall. Okay, and then to Sardinia, how did you get to Sardinia? We flew, uh, they flew, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to Sardinia, we went by boat, by um, Italian uh, cruiser. And we slept on the deck, uh, or stayed on the deck, because it was, was there any concern about U-boats? Well, we didn't worry about it, so I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that was a problem. Okay. And where in Sardinia? Cagliari, which I believe is the uh, capital of Sardinia. And okay. we had our base a little bit uh, north of, of Cagliari. And it was an old German fighter base. And the, there were six runways. So the fighters could take off at six at a time, as did we. And that was a very unusual for, mm -hmm. for bomber formations to uh, uh, take off six abreast. And, um, and you see the, we've got a yeah, map up it. here I right now. It. It's right at the southern Very tip. southern part of Sardinia, yes. Decimona Manu, is that how you pronounce the, the base where you actually were located? Oh, yeah, Decimo Mano. Yeah. That's a tongue twister. Thank you. I, I frankly had forgotten that until you mentioned Decimo Mano. Okay. And I can't recall, were you then, it was only then that you got assigned to a group? Y yes. It was then we, there were, of our group, uh, there were six new crews that joined the 320th at that time, a replacement crews, which is mean 18 airmen and 18 um, officers. And so, yes, some of us were sent to the 320th, uh, to the 441st, which is I was in. A couple of us went to the 17th bomb group, which is a sister bomb group. Now you say the 441st, that's the squadron. That's the squadron, the 320th bomb group 441st Bomb Squadron. They were 41st, 42nd, 43rd, and 44th in the 320th. Okay. So we don't confuse people as we go through this. How many aircraft in the 441st? Roughly, I would say um, 
48, I believe. In a squadron? Yes. How many in a group then? Well, now you're now you're right. 24, there were 24 in the 41st. So then there were 4 times 24. Okay. That many were was it was there a flight where the 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 squadron divided into flights as well? Uh no, not really. Okay. Okay. And what air force at that time? At that time it was the 12th Air Force. Well, under and and Mark Clark was the uh, general in charge uh, of the ground troops at that time, and the twelfth, and the twelfth. Uh, and, and of course, he was in charge of all of the ground troops in Italy at the time. Italy, right? Okay. Does that mean that that's initially the the combat that you'd be supporting was Italy or in some missions into France as well? No, not well. Yes, both, both. Uh, yeah, both Italy and France. Uh, we primarily. We're after bridges, marshalling yards, uh, uh, frontline troops, uh, things of that nature. And um, we had, I didn't realize it at the time, but I found out later that we had the highest accuracy uh, rate of any bomber group, medium bomber group around. And we were called on by Mark Clark, uh, later General Patch, later General Patton, to bomb for their front-line troops. And, uh, well, which is wanna, a very, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I, we're going to get to a very okay. detailed story here in a little bit about the importance of accuracy here. Uh, but before we get there, I wanted to ask you about uh, the typical tour. Now, we've, we hear so much, and I grew up hearing that, you know, 25 missions in a B-17 early in the war, and you got to go home because practically nobody survived 25 missions. Well, and I think then they bumped it up to 30 35. Missions. 35? And I believe that's what they stood with the heavies. And initially when we went there, they said, well, maybe 50 missions. 50 missions for the to twin engine bombers. Yeah. And then it went to 60 missions. And uh, so, and I hit 61 before they sent me home. Okay. Does a guy like you think, this isn't quite fair, they only have to do 25, 30, no. 35 missions? No, because the heavies had it bad. First of all, the heavies were over uh, enemy territory a lot longer than we were, uh, and their missions were probably about twice as long as ours. And so, no. Yeah, uh, maybe I wished at one time or another that we had only 35 missions, but when you stop to think about it, they had a pretty tough time. The heavies had a pretty tough time. Well, that's not to say that the medium bombers didn't no, have a tough time. No, we had our time, but, but uh, they were over enemy territory a lot longer, and they were subject to fighter, uh, fighters a lot more than we were. Well, one of the reasons we didn't have as much many fighters after us as the heavies did is that we were almost as fast as the fighter aircraft. And so they had a heck of a time hitting us. And we flew such close formation, wingtip to wingtip, that we had a great fighter defense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part of the lore of World War II bombers is that the pilots of the crews would name their aircraft. And then they would have that not famous the cruise, nose up. Not the crews. The, the uh, crew chief. The one that took care of that particular aircraft is the one that named the aircraft, and if they put some nose art on there, the crew, crew chief was the one responsible. Well, I didn't know that. And you mean the guys who are maintaining the aircraft that weren't going up with the aircraft? Right. They're the ones that did it. Because uh, we went to different aircraft all the time. Rarely, oh, I would fly maybe three or four times in a particular aircraft, uh, but uh, they had their aircraft every time. Can I say something about the cruise chiefs right now? Yes. In our group, they were absolutely great. Um, yeah, and I know we're going to get to it later, but for example, in the Battle of the Bulge, the weather was really, re it was the coldest winter in Europe ever. And these poor guys, cruise chiefs, uh, uh, they had to keep that plane ready to go every day even though we couldn't fly 
in the coldest weather you could ima couldn't imagine. I give a lot of credit, a lot of credit to the people that maintained the aircraft. Okay. I think by the time you got to Battle Bulge, your unit was in France by that France time. France by then, right. And, uh, but let's go back to Sardinia because yeah. I want to ask you about what life was like on that air base. And let's start with this. Did you have a lot of contact with the Sardinians? I guess that's what you call the people of Sardinia. Uh, no, n not with the Sardinians. Remember, they were mostly Italians. Uh, and they were enemies. They were en our enemies, frankly. And But in Sardinia, w we had a little contact. But we'd have a, a young guys who were ex ex soldiers for Italy, as are taking care of our house or tent or whatever we had. Uh, but no, we didn't have much contact. We did our own KP. We didn't use them for anything. Uh, in fact, during one of the uh, people, one, and I knew which one it was, but I couldn't prove it, stole my gloves. And that later became a uh, problem for me, and I'll talk to you about that. Why were the gloves so important to you? Well, these are gloves designed for, for air combat? Yeah, and um, it got to be 30 and 40 and 50 degree below uh -huh. zero. And uh, I froze my fingers. Uh, we'll get into that later. Okay. Were, uh, did you have any other problems with pests or anything like that? No, because we didn't have any. But the, but the, there were a few pets around. No, pests. Pests. No, not really. <laughs> well, okay. Okay, you brought it up, and I'd forgotten all about this. One time we were in a... We had kind of a stone house. My... The two people that were in, and we bought our share of the house when we moved into it, uh, they were ground crew. And, um, but in the tent next door, we all of a sudden we heard some shots, bing, 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 bing. And uh, it was more like pop, 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 pop. And um, they were, one of the guys in the tent was going after a rat that was crawling up the pole. I don't know whether they caught it or not, but anyway, yeah, we had rats. But uh, in our stone house, for some reason, I don't recollect any. Were mosquitoes a problem? Yes, but we had mosquito netting at night. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, we had mosquito netting at night, and we used it. Boy, we had to because uh, you had malaria and stuff like that there. And so we had the at night, we needed the netting. Okay. What did you do when those moments you had some off time for entertainment? Well, there was just a, every once in a while they have a dance on the base or something like that. We didn't have much in Sardinia. Well, in, in nowhere did we have until we maybe we got to France. We had a little bit more, but in France and Corsica, no. Well, here you are on this air base. There's no women in we your unit, cards. right? We played cards. Hearts was a favorite. Hearts, okay, not poker. No, well, not for us. Okay, we didn't have money. I'm I'm curious of who came to the dances. Were you just? Oh no, they'd bring women in from the villages. And not, I guess they did in Sardinia too, but I didn't go. In France, is they brought women in from the villages. Okay. And I'm not going to go into detail there. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> okay, I heard. You now I, I'm going to refer a lot of the questions I've got is because I took some time to read some of your journal. Why don't you hold up the journal here so we can see that and then get a sense of how thick it is. Yeah, this and is first journal and that's me at three years old. And you mentioned before we started today, you're working on your second journal. Yeah, I'm working on my second journal. This one ends uh, about the time my, uh, my wife of 56 years, wonderful years, uh, died and I ended it at that time and I thought I wasn't gonna do any more and uh, no, I thought I'd better continue. And so I'm in my second journal already. And I'm going to uh, rename it. This is the uh, Gerald Rashke Lifetime Journal. I'm going to say Gerald Rashke Lifetime Experience, my first 100 years. 
And in six years, I expect to finish the <laughs> second one. You're an optimistic man here. I, yep. I love that spirit. Okay. Did you have a chance to hear Axis at Sally? Oh, oh, she was great. Oh, she was great. That was the best program we had. We listened to her music all the time. And, okay, Axis Sally knew more about what was going on in our squadron than we knew ourselves. She would tell, for example, uh, usually our ships were camouflaged. Well, pretty soon we got the silver ones. And she told us that we were getting three new aircraft, and they were silver. And she knew it before we did, or she announced it before I did, before us, uh, maybe the officers knew, but the airmen didn't know. Yeah, and the music was great. American music then? Oh, both. Uh, Lele Marlene was a very favorite of ours. Yeah, no, she did both. Okay, all of the uh, the swing bands are yeah, there? Yeah, all the swing bands. It was all, all good music. Now, since she knew stuff that even the, the GIs didn't know, I would think that commanders and operations and intelligence officers are getting really nervous about oh, they, but how they knew it. They knew it. They knew that there were, especially in Sardinia, and Cor uh, especially in Sardinia, they knew it was full of Italians, that there had to be people uh, transmitting information. Corsica, I don't remember too much, but in Sardinia, uh, there were, it was full of Italians, and of course they fought for, with the uh, and against us, and so there were plenty of spies uh, giving the information, and yeah, the officers knew about okay. it. The next few questions I got are about your first mission, which is on August 5th or 6th of 1944. Target was Tarascon, a bridge, railroad bridge in France. Okay, yeah. I probably mispronounced that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think you did probably as good a job as I did. Wasn't that Arl? Wasn't that Tar Tarascon, but Arl? For, and it doesn't make any difference. It's the same general area. Um, I don't really remember that mission too thoroughly, but I'm sure we hit the target. Okay. Let me ask you a couple of general questions then. You enlisted right after you graduated from high school. I didn't you, enlist. You they drafted, drafted me. I, they, I, my draft notice, I was graduated on June 4th, and on June 11th I was in uniform. So here's, here's the question. You spent the next year getting ready for this moment. Yeah. What are your thoughts when you're going on that first mission? I was probably, I was probably apprehensive. Uh, the first mission, but I was, but probably more so, I was excited. I loved to be flying, and that's where I wanted to be. And so I would say yes, I was apprehensive, but at the same time, it was probably very exciting. The fact that my whole, whole tour was exciting. When uh, you were reflecting, uh, maybe you didn't want to reflect on things too much, but were you? Concerned about dying or more concerned about being injured severely? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's always, especially when we knew the mission was going to be rough. Uh, yes, we were, we were apprehensive, let's say that. But uh, for some reason, or, well, let's put it this way. After my fifth mission, which was when my pilot Mitchell was killed. I think I was probably apprehensive up until that time. After he was killed, shortly, sometime in the later, I made up my mind that I was not going to worry about myself any longer. If it was going to happen, it was going to happen. I didn't want it to happen, but I wasn't. After my pilot died, I came to the conclusion what was going to happen was going to happen. And uh, and that's the way I've been the rest of my life, frankly. A very stoic way of looking at things. Well, I don't know. I think it's kind of smart myself. But uh, uh, it worked. Now, a lot of combat veterans talk about the experience of being in units and that camaraderie is very tight, is very important. And yet you get the new replacements and... 
some of them say they don't want to get too close. Well, well, not only replacements, even of the old timers. We didn't get, for example, very few of the people did I know by first names. We didn't get close. We, we knew them by, uh, other than our own crew. Um, I don't know that I knew any of them by their first name, and uh, we didn't get close. Uh, there was no, we didn't want to get too close because other than our own crew, uh, because like one in three of my buddies all died, were killed. And so we were not necessarily around too long. You mentioned about getting your hair shaved to take your POW picture. Was there a concern about being a POW? Yes, there was. Always a concern about being a POW. Um, and I have a couple of stories, but we'll do those later. Uh, Yes, uh, none of us wanted to be a POW, especially if we, if we were going to be a POW, we wanted to be captured by the Germans, not the Italians, and because uh, it was it was it was difficult. But by the Germans, we knew we were going to be treated as soldiers, and um, and uh, that wasn't necessary. As, uh, See, the Italian civilians really took it out on us because we bombed their cities, we bombed them, and so we killed their people. So the Italian civilians were pretty rough on POWs. Hmm. Okay. What aircraft were you assigned to for that first mission? What do you mean, B-26? Yeah. Was it uh, piloted by Captain Mitchell? No. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't even know who the pilots were because we, um, the, the first missions, first of all, we were replacement crews and we rarely flew with our own crew. It was, I was, the first time I was going to fly with our own crew would be on my sixth mission after the invasion of southern France. I was scheduled with my pilot and the rest of my crew. Well, my pilot was killed. So from that point on, we were, quote, replacement people, and we were put on different crews. We rarely, rarely flew with the same people. Uh, later on, Lieutenant Asher was my pilot. He was a replacement. And, uh, and I flew in whatever aircraft uh, headquarters put me on. Did you, were you okay with that? Or was oh, it yeah. Well, we knew we were replacements. Uh, like I say, I, I am sorry that my pilot was killed, uh, but and we would have flown uh, with him. Yes, I was. That upset me. Mm -hmm. My pilot being c killed probably upset me more than anything else during the war, because uh, he was a great friend, a great pilot, and it should have happened. Mm -hmm. That first mission in the book, in your journal, you described it as a milk run. What what does that mean? For it means the... no flak, no fighters. In other words, we, we got up, flew our mission, dropped our bombs, came back home, no problems. Okay, you've already talked about this a lot, but August 15th, that's the uh, Operation Anvil, that's the invasion of Southern France, right. and that's the day of the fifth mission, isn't it? Uh, yes. Okay, walk us through that mission. Um, th that was kind of fun because um, uh, when, when we were flying from Sardinia to uh, France and we were approaching the coast of France, I'm telling you, the water was covered with boats and stuff, uh, the invasion forces and stuff like that. And, of course, we bombed ahead of them. And uh, uh, there were no other aircraft but our aircraft in the air. Um, if the, uh, the fighters were all over, so there was no German aircraft, no German defenses. And on that mission, as I, uh, so far as we were concerned, we had no flak. I think it was a milk run. I don't remember exactly, but, but I'm pretty sure it was a milk run. Um, we bombed, uh, it was in A-R-L-E-S, Fran France, and um, we bombed a bridge there, which is one of our primary targets and uh, came back home. But, can I tell about my pilot? Yes. I'm, my it was a night, by the way, we were taking off six abreast at night. 
And uh, my pilot was uh, in one of the leads. Uh, he was the, the squadron operations officer, the squadron commander, and one other major officer of the thing. And the, lead, the top gunner were all on this crew. My, my pilot was co-pilot. And they crashed into a mountain, exploded, full bomb load. On takeoff? On takeoff. Which is not unusual, but we didn't know what it was. Later on, we found out that uh, uh, Cap I think it was a Captain Trump, Lieutenant Captain, was one of the lead pilots, had flew the night before. But he insisted on going on the mission. And I think I mentioned last time that if you didn't have a good pilot, you were dead. And that was true here. He was not in top-notch shape. And then we didn't learn this until a long time after the war, in fact. We didn't know what happened, but I learned out after the war that he had the flu, and that's probably the cause of it. Are you telling me that you didn't know that you're very close, the man you really respected as a pilot had crashed and died. No, we didn't know. Until we you knew got that back. three aircraft crashed on takeoff, but, and he was one of them. So only when you got back you found that out. Yeah. And I think I read that then you were part of the search crew to go looking for them? Yeah, I didn't like the, uh, yeah, okay, I'll mention it. Um, I was scheduled to be with Mitch the second mission that day, and instead, I was part of the search crew, ma major search crew, that uh, see if there was anybody around that could be alive. Well, we, they were all. Can I tell you what I found? I shouldn't say that. I don't like to say. I don't. No, I'm not going to say it. Okay. It's too gruesome. What I, what what we found up there, and it was just too good. It was a horrible, horrible mess. Well, let's just suffice it to say that you did find some remains. Yes, we found some remains and I just did not go into it. Okay. And it was not good. And it was after that moment that you took a different approach to how to deal with life, huh? Yes, it was sometime after that. I can't remember, but it was almost immediately after that that I said, okay, he's gone. I'm not going to fly with him. And I, was, I actually refused to worry about myself thereafter. Had you ever flown a single mission with him as pilot? Nope, never. I was gonna my second my second mission that day was to be with him first the first mission as a pilot. Okay, so this was a two two missions in one day. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you go on that second mission? No, I was going after. Uh, I didn't have a crew. Okay, and so uh, um, we went into the search mission instead. One other question here in reference to that that mission, and again, this is the launching of Operation Anvil, the southern France invasion. How impressive was it? What are you thinking when you see this huge invasion fleet? Oh, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I mean, it was really, really impressive to see all of those boats. And of course, the men hadn't started landing yet, and uh, the, the battleships and cruisers were lobbing shells into the coast and and, uh, and then we were bombing it there was so much going on and, and I was on the tail I, people on the waist could watch what was going on better than I could get a sense I would have to think of <laughs> the incredible productivity of the American manufacturing world at the time the arsenal of democracy yeah and but remember that was pretty much well I won't say the beginning of the war because that was later on but Remember, we didn't have anything. We didn't have. We didn't have anything at the beginning of the war, and then we started our production. And the women, again, were great. I mean, if it weren't for the women that were in the factories, we wouldn't be where we are. Were then. And that was what just two months after D-Day. The mm. D-Day. Now every every major no, campaign is considered D-Day, no, but yeah. So that was June 6th for the major yeah, landing in Normandy. Yeah, 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 okay. So just two months after that. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of the ships involved with 
with the, the Normandy landing, we're supporting this operation as well. I would assume so, but don't know. Okay. Okay. You said already that there weren't there wasn't any flack that day that you no. recall? Uh -uh. Okay. August 20th, that's your sixth mission on a gun position near Toulon. Oh, okay. Toulon is one of those missions that I'll never, ever forget. Now, Toulon is actually the major city where the landing is. Major occurred. city, but we bombed the gun emplacements uh, on an island nearby. And so what we call it the Toulon mission because uh, there were... Um, Hundreds of guns shooting at us at Toulon. By the way, many of them manned by women, German women. And they were good shots. They did a great job, a, a too good a job. On that, uh, on the Toulon, we lost three aircraft. Uh, you got some um, uh, aircraft uh, blowing up photos, but uh, we lost three aircraft and being in the tail, I could see where they were coming in. I could see a, a uh, one gunner had us in their sights. He was getting closer and closer and closer. And I would be on the intercom, and I had told the pilot what I thought. And boy, one of them was getting pretty game hurt. I said, let's, and we heard bombs away, and I said, let's get the hell out of here. Excuse me, excuse me. And uh, the the pilot put it in a power drive. I mean, he really went down. We were going, we were redlined at 300 miles an hour, and we went over 300 miles getting out of there. But just as we started going down, the anti-aircraft shell went off. We ended up with 200 holes in the aircraft. Didn't know that at the time. But the pilot was able, nobody was injured. No one was injured. I had uh, flak uh, hitting me with my helmet, my flak suit, as did the others, and uh, but the pilot controlled the ship, and he felt like we couldn't get it back to Sardinia, and we landed in Corsica, and he did a good job of landing. It was on a short airstrip. We couldn't take it back off because the, air uh, the airstrip was too short uh, to take off, and I think it was a C-47 came in and took us back to Sardinia, but eventually that plane flew again. The, the crew, ground crew would come there, and patch up the holes and and so they actually brought the 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 ground crew from Sardinia oh, sure. to Corsica to yeah fix because it up. that was their ship how many people on a ground crew for per ship oh I think about four uh, there would be probably the engine be one or two engine people and the and the um, gunner 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 people for that many holes in the ship you had to be thinking somebody's looking out for us well yeah um, this will come later, but any aircraft I was on through my 61 missions, and we were knocked down, we were forced down three times. We had a number of holes in our ships. Nobody was ever injured or killed on any aircraft that I was on. Hmm. So that's the way the ball bounced. Yeah, well, I'm sure... If you stop and think, and I'm, you know, you've already said you didn't want to stop and think, but fate plays a peculiar hand sometimes. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind at all about that. Yeah. None whatsoever. Okay. August 29th was your ninth mission, and I think that's an important one. You know, this is a railroad bridge at St. Donna Piatti. Okay, in we, Italy. what else did I say about it? It was all about the accuracy of that mission. Okay, well. It was a railroad. It was a bridge. Railroad bridge. I uh, don't remember that one specifically, but uh, uh, by the way, the photo that's on there now is Lady Lynn, and that's way after my missions were over. By the way, if you want to put that at a different spot. Okay. But anyway, uh, uh, but we had the highest accuracy record of any bomb medium bomber group around, and. Uh, I can tell you about the, what happens is this. We have the lead bombardier. He releases his bombs. And, all, and we have, a, on bridges, we have a very tight formation, wingtip to wingtip. When the, when the rest of the people at the, that were be bombardiers would see that first bomb go out, they would release theirs. And so all the bombs would be in the uh, same general area. 
And if the lead bombardier hit it right, we knocked out the bridge. That's all there was to it. Once in a while, he didn't get it right. Once in a huge, great while, he didn't get it right. And we would miss it. Well, I've always been curious about this. Watched too many war movies, I guess. And I knew that was generally the case. That lead bombardier is in command of the aircraft at the time, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, absolutely. He punches the, the button or he releases the bombs. Does he deliberately kind of lead the target a little bit so that the no. mass of the, the bombs are going to hit at the same place? Oh, well, yes, because when, when, when the bombs are released, the bombs follow the aircraft to the speed because we're flying around 200 miles an hour. So when the bombs are going forward, and so the bombs go like this, and that that is very, you know, there's a mission later on that will be, well, 14th mission, one I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. Well, can I hit that one now? Yeah, let's go there. Um, this was, we knew, is a front line thing. We were bombing, uh, we were bombing in a deep valley. The, uh, the mission report said enemy troop concentration near Mount Oglioli. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, you used to pronounce it as well as I could, I guess. But uh, yes, okay. The mountain was probably roughly nine or 10,000. We were probably bombing about 11,000 feet. Uh, as I remember that mission, we took off in a very, very heavy rain, which is a very unusual case in itself. In itself. And we were uh, on a frag mission. Now, frags are a bunch of, well, they're not small, but uh, roughly about, I guess, about 50 pounds each in a cluster. And, uh, and they're t uh, altitude uh, sensitive. And so we released the bombs, and they were going like this. And usually they keep on going. Well, they got to around the top of the mountain, and they just practically stopped. What we didn't know, which is very unusual, um, uh, that there was a heavy wind, and the bombs almost stopped going forward, and was bombing straight. And we knew we were bombing our own troops, and it was uh, the, everybody that was on the flight. When we went back in the trucks, usually we were boisterous, but now we are very, very quiet because we knew we had killed a lot of our own people, and uh, we got back. Uh, to interrogation, and that's about a couple hours later. But the first thing we heard, instead of the casualty reports, General Mark Clark congratulated us on a job well done, and we had no idea what happened. Well, it wasn't until later that we learned uh, that the Germans had captured the area that our people were in, and, um, and, and we got them. Instead, and then our troops were able to go forward and, and take the place that uh, they wanted to in the first place. Fate once again. Yeah, fate. Well, believe me, we were real happy because, boy, we see, an another factor there is that we were bombing for Mark Clark, General Mark Clark, General Patch, General Patton later on, and they were in direct contact with our interrogation our headquarters uh, when we were bombing the front lines and uh, imagine uh, they went through intelligence channels to get that information to you yo yeah it was very quick i mean it was very uh, radio information sometimes we were in the uh, practically on the bomb run and we were called off for the same reason or for one reason or another so the, we were a mission or we or they would change us to go forward which we could usually do and so they called the shots, the, the generals on the ground, uh, and the front line uh, targets. Uh, the generals commanded, told us what to do, and, uh, and we were, had missions called off. We were ready to uh, a bomb, and the mission was called off because our troops had taken the area. Did you land with the bombs then when oh, you came yeah. back? Oh, yeah. We landed. Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes they'd give us another target to hit, and we would go after another target. But once in a while, we, a couple of times, <coughs> we came back with bombs. I would imagine that 
let's presume the worst and and you had killed a lot of Americans because of whatever a series of miscommunications changing in the weather whatever and the airmen know that that's a pretty heavy burden to bear it, it for the is. rest of your it life is. Uh, yeah all of us felt that uh, because we we were really despondent before we learned the truth on that one most of the time I don't remember we ever killed our own people uh, uh, and we didn't even on that time of accidentally um, and on on all the missions that I was on anyways or maybe there were others where we hit friendly troops but none that I was on that was the closest one okay what I'd like to do now here Jerry is to walk you through a typical mission and I've got a lot of questions here we're gonna start from before you're you're getting up in the morning and all the way through and I think in the process I'll be more than happy to have you weave in some of your memories and stories about specific missions here as we talk through the, the typical mission. So let's talk about a mission day. When did you normally get roused out of bed? Three o'clock in the morning. Wow. <laughs> did you know the night before? That was oh, yes. We, we, uh, we knew there were, there were mission, mission notices on the, on the bulletin boards. So we knew whether or not. Okay, I got one thing there. Uh, my engineer Johnny Hart. Uh, he would he never missed a mission that he was going to be on. But boy, you didn't dare wake him up. He, he we went to Chow at three o'clock in the morning, but we learned early on to hit him with a broomstick because he come out <laughs> <laughs> mad at a hornet. And but anyway. Uh, other than that, three o'clock in the morning, we got up, went to chow. Um, special breakfast? No special breakfast. No, just a regular breakfast. Um, usually it was um, it was later on, and then I can't remember where it started in Sardinia or Corsica. We finally got fresh eggs and fresh bacon, but mostly it was the fake stuff. And uh, uh, they gave us a good breakfast. But uh, because it had to last us until sometimes past lunch, and that was at three o'clock in the morning, and then to lunch time. And uh, but we got a good breakfast, and and it was always dark, of course, at three o'clock in the morning. And they would uh, put us in trucks and take us to the base. The ground crew had already been. When we get up at three o'clock in the morning, the ground crew ground crew is already gone. They were already, in fact, we could hear the engines warming up as we were going to chow. And uh, we'd get to the uh, ship, the trucks would take us to the ship, and we'd check our guns, and me, uh, the engineer would check the engines, uh, radio would check the radio, we'd check all of our stuff. Who's responsible for loading the bombs and the ammunition? The, um, the ground crew. It was all done already when we got there. Who armed the, the bombs? The bombardier usually <clears throat> armed after we took off. The bombardier would go back, and sometimes he hadn't gone up to the nose yet, and he would arm it. And then sometimes I would have to arm the bombs myself. If, he, if the bombardier was up uh, at the nose already, sometimes I would have to go up and and pull the tags. Okay, and that's what it was, just pull a tag and then the, the fuse is activated? Well, it wasn't, the fuse is not activated because the fuse was a propeller-like thing, and as the bomb drops, the propeller would go around, unwind itself, okay. and once the propeller was out, then it was armed. Were there any special rituals that you did? No. Anybody else? I would imagine some of these guys were superstitious yeah, about that. Yeah, some were superstitious. I wasn't superstitious. Not me. I think you're probably right, but I, I don't recollect any of them. No. Was there any, was there a prayer? At, well, we didn't even talk the pre-briefing. How much of a pre-briefing did you get? Uh, well, it was a full pre-briefing because it was primarily for the pilots and the bombardiers. And so, nav some once in a while now, but pilots and bombardiers for the briefing. The rest of us were there just to know what was going on. We had no part of it. Well, I imagine there were some parts that you were paying attention to, like the weather. 
well, in a B-26, we, yeah, we just didn't take off of it. It's usually, if there was bad weather over the target, we wouldn't even take off. Uh, we would take off in maybe rain or something like that in that one mission, but uh, usually the weather was halfway decent. Cold, yeah, in, in France, it was very cold, and that was bad, but um, no. Um, uh, target, yes. So always interested in what the target would be. What the target was, and, uh, some... and whether there was going to be any flak or whether there was going to be any fighters, and uh, yeah, we listened to that part. Were there some targets or types of targets that concerned you more than others? No, not really. Um, no, not, I mean, no target. To, unless it was a heavy flak like in Toulon, the flak was heavy, and, and, and later on I'll get into the others. But if the flak was going to be heavy, yeah, that concerned us. But no, targets itself, no. Was it the night before that you learned which aircraft you're going to be assigned to? No, we didn't. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I hadn't stopped saying. Yes, we knew what aircraft we were going to be on. Was there a prayer at the end of the briefing or any kind of religious service before each mission? Can't remember. I would assume yes. I'm going to assume yes because in those days, almost, well, not much of a one because there would be some Jewish people there. So there would be no mention of Christ, I don't think. I don't remember that, so I'm open there. Now, I know that you spent... A big portion of your life after you got out of the Army Air Force as a minister. Yes. An Episcopal minister. Yes. How important was God and your religious beliefs to you? Uh, as the war went on, more so. Uh, I wasn't really overly religious before I went into the service. After I was in combat for a while, and I think it was, well, no, is it Corsica? I think was the first time when I started attending Bible classes, and uh, I, I got a little bit more interested. In it. As the war went on, I believe yes, I became a little bit more religious. Well, there's that old comment that there's no atheist in a foxhole. That, well, that's true. And I would assume there's no atheist in a B-26 that's no, motoring think, down the hair street. No, I think it's well taken. Um, I can't recollect that there was an overabundance over of religiosity, religiosity. Uh, at the time, we did have our Sunday, uh, uh, the, the chaplains had their Sunday services, and most of us attended a service if we, it was close by. Do you ever recall saying a quick prayer when you're in the uh, in the aircraft? No, I didn't. I didn't. I don't remember it. Let's put it that way. Now, this has occurred to me. You're the tail gunner. Tell me about <laughs> the tail gunner position. I mean, what position were you in? Were you crouched over or I you was, laying down? I was or what? kneeling, and that's pretty hard on the knees. Usually kneeling, however, it was room enough that I could sit down until you're getting close to target. But once you get to target, you're on your knees. What? Uh, how much visibility do you have? Well, I had two side windows and a front window. I had good visibility. And when we came off a of target, I could see the ground easily. Okay. So, I mean, what angle here? Is you looking down, or, you, or did they have some plexiglass pretty much underneath you so you can see no, aircraft no coming? No, no plexiglass from? underneath me. Just the side of uh, me uh, and the tail gun, just side windows and the front window. Okay. So somebody can sneak up underneath you pretty easily. Well, well we had other people, yeah. I mean, uh, the bombardier could s see uh, somebody coming, the pilots could, and the uh, radio man who was in the side could look at the sides. And the turret gunner, the engineer gunner, could see above. So it was, we saw all around. Was that radio silence until you got to the target? Yes. There? Yeah. Okay. I need to back up a little bit. I want you to tell me about taking off and getting into the formation. Okay. That's a good question. Um, 
the B-26 had to take off at a very high rate of speed, especially with a full bomb load. And it would it range from 120 to, say, 150 miles an hour takeoff speed. And uh, very, very fast. And uh, the engineer would usually sit right in back of the pilot and is very close. And I always like to sit, uh, kneel, or stand on the step between the pilot and the co-pilot and watch the takeoff. The radio man was always in his seat, and the bombardier is in one of the seats because the bombardier didn't go forward until closer to target because, well, he just didn't. Um, when you get over, when we went over enemy territory, the co-pilot had to put his seat back so the bombardier could get in there. And so the bombardier would go when he felt he should, um, no specific time. Once we got over enemy territory, the bombardier was always in place. Um, um, but I take off, I love to watch the takeoffs. And um, we were just in place. And then uh, in, uh, in Sardinia, taking off six abreast, we formed up quickly. That was the reason that you had six going up at the same time? Sure, we could form up quickly. We didn't use up so much gas that way because we had a long ways to go to targets in, in Sard uh, Italy. And so, uh, and that's one of the reasons we moved to Corsica because we had to be closer, closer in. And um, we formed up fast, usually nine ship flights. We got a... a a uh, picture up here what a formation might look like. Uh, you that, said that's nine. What, that's what we generally look like. I, I know that you had flights or missions where there was less than nine and a lot of missions where there's a lot more than yeah. nine. Usually that was probably uh, either, okay, that was probably coming back from mission. Uh, there's none missing up there, so that could have been uh, on going to the mission. If there was a f aircraft missing, there would be one or two less then. Why was it so important to be flying in formation like this. Because that's tricky business, isn't it? Well, it's tricky business, but see, you can see we're very close in there. That would be most mostly a bridge thing. Now, because we we want to be close in and have a close in target. Uh, if we were uh, hitting a marshalling yard, we would be strung out a little bit more than that because marshalling yards is spread over a greater area. And if we're hitting frontline troops, we would sp spread out even more. Depends upon the target. Okay, where would you want to be in the formation if you had a preference? Oh, lead, naturally. That first aircraft. The first aircraft. But you usually, unless after I was, had a lot of missions and stuff like that and became squadron gunner, so I got into leadership more often. But more often than not, I was in the middle of the flight. Wasn't it more dangerous to be in the lead aircraft? Well, yes and no, because that's where the, all the anti-aircraft was aimed at, but uh, they didn't always hit the first aircraft. I mean, very few of the lead aircraft were shot down. Okay. I know there's a huge variety, but what was a typical range, the distance from the target? What, what do you mean by that? From the time you, you know, if you're leading okay. Sardini, how far to get to the target? Well, it depends upon how far we had to go, but usually, let's put it this way, the bombing, the the, uh, the bombardier leading us in, usually the bomb run was about a five-minute bomb run where the bombardier had control of the aircraft and we had to fly straight and steady so that the bombardier could, could get everything in. My, and he controlled the aircraft. My question, though, is how many miles before you got to the target? Depending on In Sardinia, we went... Uh, 500, 600 miles okay. because it, uh, we were up north, uh, we'd hit the Brenner Pass from Sardinia and that was a long way. That'd be about five or six hour flight total. And to figure it out for yourself, say 200 miles an hour average and we were on the, uh, gone about six hours, three hours each way, figure it out. Well, here's a peculiar question, but four hours into it and you need to relieve yourself. <laughs> well, we had a pitot, what they call pitot tube, P-I-T-O-T tube, if you had to. But for some reason or other, 
I never did. Now, today, it would be a lot different. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, uh, I never had to. But, you, yes, there was, a, there was a tube that you could use if you had to. Okay. Now, I, I think I'm going to trigger some stories here, these next few questions. Which concerned you more, flak or enemy fighters? Flak, because there was a lot. As the armed forces, as the Allies moved, say, north in, in uh, uh, Italy, the one thing the Germans really took, uh, took with them were the big guns, the 88s and the 105s. And th those are the big anti-aircraft weapons, also ground weapons, but to us they were anti-aircraft. And they would always take those guns. So the, the longer the time went on, the more time that went on, the more flack we had. And so remember I mentioned that we were so fast that really not too many fighters came out. And we had a great fighter defense. You saw how close that was. There was a lot of firepower in that in that area. And uh, um, I'll mention two things. One, uh, we had fighter escorts on occasion. P-47s, but the 47s didn't do it too much because they, we were almost faster than they were. P-51s, yeah. And the ones that we liked to see best were the red tails, the black outfit. They were great. In fact, if we'd see German fighters off into the distance and they would see the red tails, they wouldn't come in. The German fighters would never come in when we had the red tails. But we didn't have, we didn't have fighter uh, escort very often. Um, and so... Uh, Before you get past the red tails, that's the 332nd fighter group, I think, is what I, You tell me, I, I don't And know. I saw this in your article, the Abbeville Kids. Oh, the... The Abbeville Kids was a was Goering's crack fighter outfit in Abbeville, France. Okay. And the one time we were hit, and I'm saying presumably now because so far as I was concerned, it was the Abbeville Kids because they were identified by the uh, yellow noses, and uh, and they were his crack outfit. There were more. There were about twenty all told hitting all of us, but of our group. Nine, no, 12 hit us, and we got nine of them. I got one of them. I, I'll go into that one because that's kind of a funny one. Um, we got nine of the 12 that came after our group, and I got one of them, and it just so happened that the engineer gunner on my aircraft at the time was an engineer gunner. It was his first mission. And I can't remember now what was wrong with his guns, but there was something wrong with his guns. Well, being armament gunner, I had to go back and get it. So we switched. I said, Have, you go to the tail, and I'll take care of the guns. Well, I can't remember what was wrong with the guns, if anything. Probably nothing. Uh, but before we were hit by the fighters, by the Abbeville kids, by the nine fighters, while I was in the turret, and the engineer was in the tail, and he froze. He got scared, and he froze. He, and there was one aircraft, that, one of ME-109, that was coming in after us. He froze. He, did never, he never fired his guns. And I believe, I'm only, I can't tell what the German pilot had on his mind, but I think he felt that since I couldn't fire at him in the turret because of the cutoffs, there was a cutoff so that I didn't shoot off my own tail. So I didn't fire, tail didn't fire. So this ME-109 pilot came right up alongside me. Now this was not skill on my part, no way, shape, or form. He was a sitting duck, right off of my, at, the, at nine o'clock. So I gave him a burst, I got him, I got the pilot. Uh, ME-109s were highly, um, had, mm, had uh, a lot of metal around him, so, but I, the pilot jumped up, slumped over, so I, I, I was pretty sure I got him, and he went into a dive, and I was too busy, we were too busy checking other aircraft, so I didn't see him crash,
But another engineer on another ship, his name was Gene Folk, confirmed it for me that the guy went out of the control after I lost sight of him. And that's, that's all I can tell you about that. So somebody had to confirm that if you oh, yeah. you're credited with a kill? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just a uh, possible, so far as I was concerned, because I didn't see the guy go down. But Gene, uh, the, this other engineer on another aircraft, I didn't know Gene. I don't know. I didn't even know him very well. But he saw it go down out of control, and he confirmed it for me. Do you have any others that you knew that you'd hit the enemy aircraft? No, nope, it was the only time we were ever hit. We were never hit by fighters after that. And ME 109, that was the, the war course of the German Air Force. Yeah, they, uh, there was one Focke-Wulf in the formation. I didn't see it, but they were telling me there was one Focke-Wulf. Focke-Wulf 190? Yeah, I, that, and I didn't see that. I just saw the Messerschmitt. Yes, the German Messerschmitt was a great aircraft. How about uh, the jets later in the war the germans started i think it was the me-262 we were very fortunate remember the heavies were bombing the plasti oil fields and and hit the oil fields and we hit the marshalling yards so that they they couldn't um, uh, help their troops you know the germans ran out of gas and the pilots were short on fuel the same with the jets. They could hit us once. In fact, they did. We were hit by the jets one time. Three of them came out of the, I mean, they came out of the sun and knocked off three of us right now. And by the time they got around and come back, we could, we could shoot at them. But then they didn't have any more fuel, so they had to leave. They would hit us one time. That's all the fuel that they had. And, uh, and like I say, we were pretty fast, but not as fast as the jets. And so as a squadron combat instructor after that, or maybe before that, because we knew a little bit about them, uh, we, had to we had to come up with a defense for the f jet fighters. And um, we devised that they were so fast, we couldn't lead them. So we had to blanket all the all of the gunners had to aim their guns at one particular spot and hope to God the jet fighter would run into it, which did happen, I guess. But we were never hit. After that one time when three of us were knocked down, we were never hit again. You mentioned the red tails and how glad you all were when you saw the red tails. Did you or your... We didn't know they were black at the time. Oh, really? Nope. We didn't know it. Well, you saw you, th you figured where I was heading with this question, that you know they're treated so poorly back in the yeah, United the, States. Well, they were treated so poorly in the Air Force too. They were treated. I mean, even when they were fighting combat, until they proved themselves, uh, they weren't even allowed into the officers' messes. But after they proved themselves a few times, they were buddies. But you didn't know that. Uh, no, I didn't know until after the war. Really. All we knew is when we saw the red tails, we were in good shape. And the red tails, of literally red tails on oh, the yeah. aircraft. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay. How often did you have cause to fire your your fifty cal when you were on missions? Just those two times. That's it, just That's twice. It. Yeah. Yeah. An awful lot of firepower went up with those aircraft. Didn't That's it? right. But, but see, I think it was, for example, remember I said the heavies were, we had a great fighter defense. We were so close in and had so much firepower that I guess they got wise. When I know that the German high command by that time of the war, we're talking 1944 and into 45, just to try to prevent as much of the bombing in Germany itself. And that was, as you said, that's the heavy bombers. So yeah. they were probably the primary target. Well, it, no, yes and no. Uh, when you remember, the heavies were over enemy territory a lot longer. But when they hit a city, like they were hitting Berlin or Essen or one of the big ones, all their firepower slack was in that one area. Same way for us. Like... Um, 
and we'll get into it a little later, the Broadstock Bridge had over 100 guns defending it. And boy, it was a, it was a wicked place. And it depends upon the target for us. If it was an important target for the Germans, well, they had a lot of guns firing at us. How many missions, percentage-wise, involve some kind of flak? Almost, as time went on, in the beginning, not too much, but it, once we got to Corsica, it was almost every mission had flak. But, like I said, we were fast, and, and, and the Germans, I don't know what their method was, but they would hit, they, the flak would go off at certain altitudes. And if the flak was going off at our altitude, we were in trouble. But if it wasn't, we didn't get hit. Were you always flying at the same altitude, or no. did that vary from mission to mission? We would kind of start at 12,000 feet and gradually go down toward the target. We would bomb between 11 and 10,000 feet. Which sounds relatively predictable, easier for the flak crews to yeah, be hit. Yeah, but they would say, let's say they would pick 11,000. If we were at 10,000, no. Okay. Unless the shell hit us by itself, and that would sometimes happen. And from everything you said, you kept that tight formation going into the target. Oh, had to. Had which to. makes you a nice, big, fat oh, target. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I came back, uh, our ship came back with a lot of holes in it. Did you worry as much about re maintaining the formation on the, way, on the trip back? No. No, we didn't have to worry about it. We, we would loosen up going back, oh, unless we were over enemy territory. Okay. Now, you've, you've said many times here, the B-26, you like the speed, you like the durability, but it was a bear to be the pilot. And I'm wondering, when you actually jettison all those bombs, you lose 2,000 pounds, that's got to be a challenge for the pilot to deal with suddenly. Oh, no. No, they, they, no. No? Why would they, why would you say that? Well, that you've, suddenly the dynamic well, of the aircraft Well, yeah, but he different. knew, he knew what was happening. Uh, oh, you mean uh, over target and stuff? Yeah. No, he knew what was going to happen, and he, they had their control. Okay. I don't, it, uh, depending upon the target and and the uh, flak, uh, sometimes we'd gradually come off target, or if it was flak was bad, we'd go fast and stuff. Like that. It just depended upon the situation. Now you've already described one mission where the pilot made evasive maneuvers as soon as the bombs were gone. Yeah. Was that typical? No. Well, we made evasive action, but not that, not that time because. We, over Toulon, it was horrible. Okay. Your reason for making these bomb runs is to get those bombs out of the ship and watch the target area. Was that something that you and the rest of the crew were watching the bombs go down? Mm. Most of the time, I, I'd have to say, yes, because we, we had to report back to interrogation later what we saw or didn't see. And... Um, but see, <coughs> one of my very good pals, uh, uh, Rawl, I mean, um, Blue, I don't know what his first name was, uh, Blue is his name, he was a squadron photographer, he was a good friend of mine, and they had, they had, I think they were called K-10 cameras, I can't remember, exactly. big, big cameras, and Blue would, if he was on the ship with me, he would let me take some pictures on occasion. In fact, one of the pictures in the thing, they are one of the real good photos in the journal I took. Uh, I, I didn't see what I was taking. I just put the camera out like this and clicked it, pulled the trigger. Out the waste window? Or? Yeah, out of the waste window. Yeah, that's what we did. That's where he was. He was usually in a waste position. And, um, uh, but, but Blue took most of the pictures. A lot of the photos you see in there were taken by Blue. Okay. I know also... Uh, Question on the uh, the bombardier was he using the Norden bomb site? The lead bombardier was had the Norden bomb site, and usually a backup. Uh, there would be one or two backups in case something happened to the lead bombardier. But not all the aircraft. No, no. In fact, let me make one point before I forget it. I mentioned about blue, and the photographer. You notice there are some 
uh, color photos in my... Well, Joe Kingsbury was a professional photographer before he was taken into the Air Force. He brought... I had never heard of a 35 millimeter camera with color film in it. And that was the only color film that you will see in there. Any color film was mostly done by Kings, it was done by Kingsbury. But anyway, what was your question before I interviewed? We were talking about the Norden bomb site. Oh, Norden, yeah, okay. I don't know exactly, but I think that the lead bombardier for sure would have the Norden. And I would assume that maybe one or two backups would have the Norden. We had, what they, and my radio man became one, we called togglers. Remember I said that we locked, watched the lead bombardier and the first bomb. Well, the rest of us would toggle the bombs out. And all you do is pull, pull a switch. And you knew because you were watching that lead aircraft? Absolutely. There was no communication going no on? No communication. Once you got fighter pilots coming at you, the enemy fighters, I would assume, then there was lots of chatter. No, not too much. Not with, well, yeah, we, when fighters, the tail, yes, okay, yeah. But really, that, we didn't, like I say, we were hit by the Abbeville kids once. Yeah, there was chatter then, and I hadn't thought of it until you just brought it up. And then when the Jets hit us, uh, we were flabbergasted. I mean, we had never seen anything so fast before. And, uh, but there wasn't a lot of chatter there because it, they didn't come back. So there wasn't even internal to the aircraft? There was no communication with, within the crew? No, not unless we had to ha had something to say, had something important to say. A five-hour flight of, of silence and Oh, wind. yeah. No, no, we didn't talk back and forth at all. Huh. No, no, no. Well, here's one that surprised me, and I read this in your journal, that sometimes you guys didn't fly with bombs, you flew with chaff. Okay. I flew a few chaff meetings. That was tinfoil. Did you, did you, chaff is just tinfoil. And it was, uh, especially where we're going to have heavily defended uh, things, um, uh, you, you would go somewhere, to, you'd be ahead of the flight a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. And then we'd be in the waste windows just throwing out this tinfoil like mad. Well, it, it kind of screwed up the uh, anti-aircraft gunners. Supposedly. I don't know that it really did that much good, my personal opinion. Would you have preferred to be carrying bombs instead oh, of tinfoil? Oh, gotcha. I didn't want to play carry shaft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Heavens, yes. Heavens, yes. Okay. Did the um, group typically take the same route back? I... No. No, it didn't, because we had... We had different routes we had to take going to target. I would say coming back would be more or less a direct route. Okay. I'm sure you're sitting there, you're seeing an awful lot what's going on, especially if you got your wish and you're in one of the lead aircraft. Um, how many times did you see aircraft go down or aircraft get hit? Oh, pr I probably well, saw a lot of them get hit, including us. Uh, and we'd come off a of formation, <coughs> but we'd be under control. Toulon was the biggest one where we saw song go down in flames. And there were a couple of missions uh, where uh, Stuttgart was bad. Um, I see, uh, but see at the tail, you didn't see many go down. Uh, you, you, I didn't, now that you mention it, I didn't see that many go down. But you'd find out about it once you got oh, back yeah. to base, huh? Well, when you get back into formation, you know what uh, there's a ship missing or something like that, yeah. Again, that's got to get your attention. Not really. I guess we didn't pay much. Uh, well, I didn't. I don't know about the others, but I didn't. Uh, no. Uh, because uh, Just because they pulled out, because it could be that they were somewhat uh, shot up, but they'd be slower and, and, and join another group mm -hmm. or something like that. Okay, let's get you back to base then and landing again. That uh, was hairy. It was hairy. Oh, heavens, yes. I mean, a B-26 had to be 
flown into the ground. You did, maybe the last couple of feet you might have pulled up and, and coasted in, but you're still coming in at roughly 150 miles an hour. Because, uh, and we had to have a long airstrip. Were there, if, if somebody gotten shot up, I would assume they got priority to land first? Yes, uh, presumably. Um, uh, for example, on the one mission that we got shot up, um, we were coming in hot, very hot. Which means? Uh, we were flying in, we, we didn't go in, for, usually you go in formation and go around the, we came in direct and we, uh, uh, because we were, uh, Asher didn't have a good control of the aircraft uh, as much as he wanted. And then he got caught in prop war. He could have landed okay had he not got caught in prop wars coming in too close to another ship. And we crashed with a full bomb load. With a full bomb load. Yeah. Boy, if you don't think we didn't get out of that ship fast. Because <laughs> we didn't, I mean, we didn't blow up. So we were safe that far, but we didn't know what was on, happening with the bomb. So we took off like grease lightning. In fact, I hurt my knee. The only time I've ever hurt, and I chipped this ring. And that's the only thing that happened. Well, tell me about the ring. My mother, this is my high school graduation ring. My mother uh, took me to Brown Jeweler in Omaha, Nebraska, let me pick out my own ring. Pick this thing out. It's never, re almost never been off my finger. Proud of your high school class. Uh, well, it wasn't so much that, it was proud of the ring. Okay. Once you get on the ground then, Mission debriefing? Yes. Now, you said the briefing, it was primarily for the pilots and the bombardier. Yeah, but we all took part in the, the interrogation afterwards because everybody had a little something to say. But primarily the pilots and the uh, um, bombardier would uh, be the primary ones being interrogated. What kind of information were, I assume intelligence officers doing the debriefings, yeah. What kind of information were they looking for? Well, did you hit the target? That was primary. Uh, what did you see on the ground? Um, I have a story on that one if you want. Yeah. And this may or may not be true. <laughs> may or may not be true. I'm colorblind, and I think I mentioned that last time. I'm colorblind. Now, most of the people saw things on the ground that I did not see, Okay. But obviously, I may have seen some things that they didn't see. And uh, one mission, uh, this is after we got to France, I reported seeing some ammunition piles. I put it to an air occasion, hit the sack, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got called back to interrogation. Uh, they said, you reported some ammunition piles. Where? So I showed them. And, and I had enough missions at that time. I knew what was going on. I mean, I knew where I was and what it was. So I pointed out the maps where I saw them. Are you sure? And I said, sure, I'm sure. So I went back to bed. Okay, I heard, n I heard nothing more about it ever. But about a week or so after that, uh, we had to hit some targets, ammo targets, ammunition dumps. And I didn't real, I didn't, uh, I wasn't paying attention, I guess. I didn't realize we were going back to that same area. And um, we hit three underground ammunition dumps there. And the smoke in, in, in there, uh, maybe they'll show it in, in one of these, the huge plumes of smoke. In fact, one of our aircraft presumably was uh, had holes in the ship from the explosion. And the only thing that comes to my mind, I have no proof of it, no nothing, is I was the only one that reported that area. And probably because I was colorblind. Anyway, they went back there about a week or 10 days later, and we really creamed them. We had three, 
I don't know how many hundred miles away, away, we could still see those three plumes of smoke mm. way in the air. You knew you were heading back to the same place that you'd seen the... I didn't the, realize at the time until after the mission. Ah, okay. How frequently did uh, the group come back and had casualties? Uh, quite often, quite often. Uh, uh, most of the time, the... Um, First aid people were out there to take off the casualties. See, we were the shot down, dead. In the plane, there were injured people. And uh, I don't recall, well, maybe there were, there were probably some dead ones, but I don't know. And if we were close enough to the base, some of us go out and help take off the injured. And uh, yeah, there was, there was our share of injuries. Um, what happened to the injured? They went to the hospital. Was there a hospital right there on base? Yeah, close to, very close to. Yeah, yeah. They, we had we had good uh, good hospital facilities always by our bases. Uh, complete the hospital crews, uh, doctors and nurses. With doctors and nurses, I don't know about complete, but I mean, uh, they had some pretty good because some of those guys come back and flew more missions. Mm. I'd imagine the nurses were pretty popular when it was off-duty time. I don't know. I imagine they were, but I didn't have... They were officers. We were enlisted men. <laughs> oh, there's benefits to being an officer, Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I would say so. I I really didn't get to the hospital that often. I, I'd go visit some of my friends that were in the hospital and paid more attention to them than I did to the nurses, I think. Yeah. But, uh, Going back to the coming back... Could you land a B-26 on one engine? Oh, if you're a good pilot, you could. You, uh, yeah, w uh, that was a done. Uh, you want me to tell you a story there? Yeah. It has nothing to do with combat. We were in training. I think I told you. Did I tell you about the one where my pilot shut off the engines? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll shut off both engines. Both and, and he landed. Yeah, it can be done if you had a good pilot. By then, by the time we were in combat, most of the pilots were good. And as long as it was flying with one engine up to that point, I would say most of the time they'd be able to land it okay. Pretty rugged aircraft if it did take a lot of flak hits? Yes. Very, very, very strong aircraft. Because we came back with holes many, many times, and, um, the, and the ground crew just patched it up. Mm. Okay, we got you on the ground now. The casualties are taken off the field. You get back. What do you do to unwind after a mission, after the debriefing? Go to sleep. We went to bed. We hit the sack. Uh, and now, yeah, we just hit the sack. We, uh, we, uh, there was a um, tent usually where you could, in the very beginning of the war, when, when we were first there, you, you could come back and have a shot of whiskey. Well, Hart always got my whiskey because I didn't drink. And then, uh, but a little later, then it was coffee and donuts, the Red Cross. And, um, but that wasn't really unwinding. When we, uh, when we got back to our tents, we would usually hit the sack because we were tired. There's a tiring five or six hours of intense. Yeah, I don't think. It, an average person quite can comprehend how much energy is sapped out of you That's right. at doing that. No, we were, we were really tired. Okay. Was there an enlisted club? No, there's an officer's club, but I never knew of an enlisted club. Speaking about officer's club, my pilot, Joe, I mean, my, my uh, bombardier, Joe Mirabella, Italian, spoke Italian fluently, especially when we were in Sardinia and Corsica. And two things. One, he was in charge of the officers club, and he would always go to Italy to get the booze. <laughs> and they had a good club. Now, have you ever heard of the term Catch-22? Yes. Did you ever read the book? I started to. Okay. Now, my this was not my bombardier, but that, I, what was it? author's name. I can't think of his name. I hear it all the time and I just can't remember. 
he put the, the, the crazy guy on that in that book and catch 22 was a bombardier and the and the and the author knew my bombardier and knew that he went to Italy to get the booze was in charge of the officers club so my bombardier was the was the guy how do I want to say he the, the guy in catch 22 was after my bombardier mm. uh, it was totally fabricated because my pilot was a great guy he was married at the time and very true to his wife so he was not a crazy guy mm. well th anybody who's watching this is going to have to run and, and get their own copy of catch 22 but, but you hear the term catch 22 most people don't know where it came from <clears throat> Or some people might not even be aware today. I wonder how many kids today know what that even means. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. Because very few people have read. I mean, that Catch-22 came out after, shortly after the war. Yeah. Essentially, is you'd have to be crazy to do what they did all the time. Well. But if you're proven crazy, then you can get off the flight. Or yeah, something or something. Like I don't know. I, don't, I read the book, I kind of think. <clears throat> I don't remember it that well, except I remember the crazy bombardier. And I said, that's not Mirabella. Mm. But... Uh, Okay, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, there's an officer's club. Sounds like they got plenty of alcohol in the oh, officer's club. Oh, they sure did. There's no enlisted or an NCO club? Not that I remember. Does that mean to tell me that the, the enlisted guys didn't get the alcohol like the officers did? No, we didn't. Now, in France, our, chat, uh, the, our tent was next to the bar Madame Monnier owned the bar next door to our tent city. Yeah, they, we went over there and have our wine. I don't know whether there's anything else besides wine or not. I would think you guys would be awfully jealous of those officers getting all that alcohol. And well, probably were, but they were officers, so yeah. they got. So personally, that wasn't a problem for no, you? No, uh-uh. It wasn't for me especially because I didn't drink. So maybe, maybe with some of the enlisted men, maybe yes. I don't know. Here's something else I know and, and make all these assumptions, but it seems like almost everybody smoked. Yes. Yes. Uh, but the only time I smoked is when I didn't fly. Then I got nervous. When I was flying, I was fine. And uh, I saved up most of my cigarette ration and took it back with me when I got back home and gave it all to my sister. Your cigarette rations. You're getting cigarettes. Rations, yeah, regular cigarette rations. Uh, I think we got about a. If I remember right, we got a carton of cigarettes for our rations every so often. And I can't remember how often we got them. What was the brand? <laughs> All kinds of brands, but Lucky and Camel, and Marvel, Chesterfields, yeah. I would imagine also that uh, that might be lucrative trading materials yeah, with the local natives. If I wouldn't have been so darn stupid, yes, I would have been able to get a bunch of stuff, but I wanted to save the uh, cigarettes for my sister, and uh, you're absolutely right. I was kind of <laughs> naive because I could have bought a lot of good stuff, especially in France, uh, through cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But I... Tell me about the food that you got, uh, especially Sardini and Corsica. What kind of meals were you getting? Well, it's ersatz food in Sardinia for a while. I mean, what, fake what eggs, kind of fake bacon. Okay. Um, uh, the food in Sardinia was not very good. When we got to Corsica, as a, we got better and better food as the war went on. And... Uh, I got, a, I got a story there. Sure. This was in Corsica. Um, we were on KP. We saw these beautiful steaks and loaded. And I thought, oh gosh, we're gonna have some good, good steaks. What'd we get? We got hash. And we were really, really, aggravated and we were walking by the mess hall the the, the the cook's tent and they were cooking steaks 
And that really, really aggravated us. So one night later, uh, this, this was in Corsica, um, we dug underneath the mess hall and got into the refrigerator and got a bunch of stuff and took it back to our tent. We had to hit it, hide it under the metal plating on our, the, the, and the cooks or the KPs came looking for it and they never found it. But we ate pretty good for a few days. You had to cook your own food though. Oh yeah, it. but that was no problem. <laughs> okay. Now you mentioned Corsica. Do you remember roughly when you got to Corsica, when the 320th moved there? I really, like I say, time flies in such a way. I would say that it was probably August to September. Okay, so a few months in Sardinia before you moved yeah. farther, farther north, closer to the battlefield. Yeah, exactly. What was different about Corsica versus Sardinia? Now I know that it was French island before the war. It's a French island. Mountains were in back of us, and a lot of green. And uh, it, was, it was actually Corsica was a beautiful island. It was really. Really beautiful. The, um, uh, okay, you got me in Corsica now. And this is right at the very beginning of Corsica. We were putting up our tents, getting ready to put up our tents. And <clears throat> we were digging the holes around the tent to take care of the groundwater, rainwater. And two Frenchmen were walking down the aisle, so to speak, or the kind of a street where we were. They were laughing and laughing, and they were really talking a blue streak French, of course. We didn't understand it. So for some reason or other, we stopped them to ask what it was, why, why they were laughing so hard. We couldn't understand French. They couldn't understand English. But they got across to us. They pointed to the mountains, and then they said, aqua. And, and we were in a wash. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't realize, but we, uh, our tent, we caught on to it, that that we uh, that when it rained, it was really bad. So all the dirt we took out of, and we, by the way, we made the trenches even wider than usual. I think they were about a foot wide and about six, eight inches deep. We put all the dirt on the floor of the uh, tent. And of course, we had steel matting that went over that. And uh, so we were really high up, and the, and the rest of the guys were all laughing at us and stuff like that until it rained. Now, we're, our tent was the only one that didn't <laughs> get out of the water. And we, so we had the last laugh, but it was good. Was that the same tent that you hid the, the yes. stolen rations yes, in? Yes, because we had the room underneath it. <laughs> we didn't have to dig. Very good. Okay. Uh, did you have a some more dealings with the French population there? No. Uh, we did get into Bastia, uh, which is the uh, main city there, which is a gorgeous city, beautiful, modern city. Um, so we got around it. Uh, uh, I got some interesting pictures in there. Um, there's one, I took one picture of a like it was an apartment complex, and things hanging on the line. So we were back in 80 or 85, and I still swore the same clothes were hanging on the lines. And we went back to that same area, same buildings were there. <coughs> I took a picture of a uh, of a statue in the park there, whatever it is, square. When I went back in 80 or 85, I can't remember which one, the statue was still there, but they were building something around it. So I had my wife take a picture of me and with the statue. Well, she got a picture of me, but not very little of the statue. But anyway, the statue was still there, but it was going to be covered up by buildings shortly thereafter. Mm. Okay. Were you flying, once you got to Corsica, was the group flying, still supporting missions in, in Italy, or is it more and more in France? France? Mostly, mostly in... Uh, France, no, both Italy and France, we were hitting in the Brenner Pass area. The Brenner Pass had high mountains too. Now, 
help us identify where Brenner Pass is. It's, it was part of the Alp Mountains uh, uh, in Italy. Is that uh, kind of between Italy and Austria? Yes, I would say yes. Okay. I hadn't given that much thought, but yeah. Uh, the thing about Brenner Pass area, we, we'd bomb the bridges right alongside the mountain. And uh, it was an odd and eerie feeling to see us being shot at from above. The Germans had gun emplacements. They weren't 88s or big guns. There was probably 20 millimeter or maybe machine guns. But you could see the fire coming down from the top of the mountain at us. That was <laughs> odd. Yeah, I don't think that would be a comfortable feeling at I all. I don't think they ever got any of us. I don't know. Uh, maybe they did, but and we didn't, we never got hit. It sounds like you would have been lower than 10,000 yeah, feet we'd at be that time. Yeah, usually around 10,000 feet, yeah. Mm. Okay. Any other memorable missions while you're in Corsica? Not, not that I can think of offhand. It was after we got to France we had the more memorable okay. ones. You know, because in, in Corsica we were still, in, still hitting bridges uh, and some front line stuff. Okay. I'm going to probably save the discussion about the missions and activities that once you were moved to France for the next time we meet. Okay. I wanted to finish today with, and I might be overlapping this, but you became the squadron combat instructor. What does that mean? Well, uh, it, and I think I became that in Corsica. Yeah, I think it was in Corsica. <clears throat> um, I don't know why I was chosen, although I did have very high grades in my armament classes in the States, <clears throat> uh, like I say, I was a very, very poor student in high school. But for some reason or other, I applied myself in the classes of armament training. And, and uh, if that was a part of my record, that was maybe why I was chosen. But I was chosen to be squadron gunner and squadron combat instructor. And so I conducted classes, especially when we got to France, uh, with the French. I had, <clears throat> um, while pilots taught, see, we had, we had the French Air Force with us. Uh, it was part of it, especially when it was in, in France. We would be, when we moved to France, we became the first tactical air force. We'll get into that the next time, but, um, um, our pilots taught combat to the French B-26 pilots, and I taught gunnery to the French gunners uh, and, and our American gunners, and that was part of my job as a gunner and as combat instructor. Primarily the new people who were arriving in the unit? Yes, replacements. Well, how did you deal with the French? Because you mentioned earlier you didn't know French. No, I didn't know French, and I still didn't know French, but... Um, uh, we would usually have a translator that could go back and forth. And when we didn't, with gunnery, you can, you can kind of get through it. But uh, most of the time in the French, I had a, a translator. Okay. What did you think of the French, the ones that you were training? Oh, great. They, the, uh, they were great. Uh, they were hard fighters. They took many heavy losses. Um, they were gung ho. They were really. I really liked them. Okay. And uh, and the French people, I liked. I liked the French people. Um, I still get. Well, it's because I got this one medal, but um, I mean, I'm. I hear a lot. And I used to get a lot of letters from them after I got back. I'd write to them. I became well acquainted. I was back to France. In 1980 and 1985, went back to my old areas and everything. We'll get into that next time. You mentioned that the Italians, um, many of the Italians didn't treat the, the uh, American pilots who were downed over Italian because, uh, uh, because they'd gotten beaten up so bad by yeah. the American Air Force. And, and because they were part of the Axis, remember. 
okay, the kind of Mussolini. that's part of the answer to my next question is the French had a different attitude, but they were pummeled by American bombers as well. Yeah, but but they we were on their side. And uh, give you, and this is next time too. But when we landed, when we went from Corsica to France, we landed at the airport aerodrome in Longueuil. And that was near Dijon. Now, we had nothing to do with it whatsoever, so far as Americans are concerned. But they thought we freed them because the Germans were just on the other side of Dijon. And uh, boy, they, they welcomed us with open arms because the Germans were still within sight of Dijon when we landed our aircraft there. Jerry, that's probably a good way for us to finish today. It's yeah. been a fascinating discussion. Really get some insights of what it was like for you to be that B-26 tail gunner and uh, seeing lots and lots of combat. Yeah, but it was very, very exciting. Very exciting. Well, now we've teased the audience for next time. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jerry. And, and maybe... Thank you for being with us today. And, uh, and maybe I'll have the printer fixed. Okay. And I can give you some other notes to go with your cheat seat. Well, I got more time to do homework now. <laughs>